Good afternoon. We'll hope that uh, don't have any uh, technical issues here with me pressing the wrong keys. Uh, Anyway, I'm WA3FET. I always tell people I invented the field effect transistor, but not not quite, you know. <laughs> and I want to thank Tim for doing this uh, for many, many years, uh, putting on this antenna forum. And I remember doing a lot even back in the 1980s. Uh, we, we did a lot uh, together. I'm also, it seems like uh, I'm the ringer for for antennas today, okay? It seems like it's more propagation, but I do like propagation, so maybe I'll do a talk on propagation some year too. Uh, anyway, you probably see the screen here. Uh, that's me up on the upper right uh, as an undergrad student at uh, Penn State, and uh, uh, did a lot of playing around with antennas uh, back in those days and the first modeling codes that uh, could uh, model antennas. It was called AMP, Antenna Modeling Program, and so forth. And then up on the upper left is uh, the HARP antenna. And uh, I also worked on the design of, of HARP. And, uh, and then Arecibo, as you know, of course, that uh, uh, did uh, uh, crash in December of 2020. But I was a summer student there in 1974, about 50 years ago, and I've been doing work ever since at, at Arecibo with antenna designs and, and so forth. And I'll talk a little bit more. And then I just retired from uh, Penn State in December as uh, Professor Emeritus after 33 years being a professor and associated with Penn State for about 50 years, actually. And that picture at the bottom was our outdoor antenna range. And uh, they uh, decided to name it after me, and I wasn't even dead yet, you know, so that's, that's pretty cool. Let's see if this works. I just have to mention a couple things. Uh, Tim will permit me, I think. Uh, back when uh, COVID started, uh, some of us had an idea to start something where, uh, you know, we're all at home and, and uh, can't go out much. Ham radio is the greatest thing in the world. Let's try to make friends all over the world with ham radio. And uh, we would get on almost every night. And uh, uh, Tim was one of the, the, the main guys and myself and a whole bunch of other. And most of the people were uh, people that started this thing were people that had uh, contest stations, big antennas. And so we came up with this name, Big Gun Friendship Net. But it was really the friendship is what we were after, not so much the big gun. The big guns attracted all the people, and then we made friends. And this is just a small sampling of all the people in there. It's uh, hundreds of people that have joined this thing. And we kept it going for quite a few years. Of course, when COVID started going down, uh, then we went off to other things, and some of us don't get in there as much. But it's still being held. Uh, some people are still doing it on 7128 on 40 meters on Monday, uh, Wednesday, and Fridays at about 7 o'clock Eastern time to about 10 p.m. So check it out sometime, and you never know. Some of us might uh, uh, be in there uh, some of the times. A lot of the talks I've, I've given over the years have been related to contesting and big antennas. I always say this is uh, the contest station we built at Penn State, but not quite, okay? That's the, uh, the woodpecker antenna, one of the arrays of, of that uh, uh, system. Uh, but we did build a contest station at Penn State, had uh, many 200-foot towers and uh, a lot of... Uh, testing of, of these OWA Yagi ideas that I came up with and so forth. And uh, we did do contesting and, and uh, did about 100 contests from there and, and used the call from Penn State, K3CR. And uh, Alex, LZ4AX from Bulgaria, was uh, uh, the main operator over all that time and set some records and, and all kind of one, usually in the top uh, three to five, sometimes even higher in uh, a lot of the contests there. And then I also uh, worked with my uh, brother from another mother, Angel over there, WP3R uh, from Arecibo. 
and we built a contest station in 1998 in, in Puerto Rico. And uh, uh, that contest station did really good, especially in sweepstakes. Uh, and it also won the world in ARRL, both modes and things like that. So that was, uh, that lasted about 20 years until Hurricane Maria came along and that, that really did a job on it. So everything's laying over the hill now with the 10,000 beer cans that it took to put it up, okay? And that's how the propagation is, is, is good from, yeah, that's the ground plane. That's why we had such good propagation. It's all those 10,000 beer cans that went over the hill. There's just some of the antennas there. And that's how close we were to the observatory, okay? We, we were the, the highest hill in that area, and we were pretty much level with the platform of the observatory. And you know, the observatory's uh, pretty much gonna be shut down and, and uh, it's not gonna be doing much there anymore. But there's still these, these 600 kilowatt uh, transmitters. So I'm trying to get Angel to say we could build a contest station with these. That would, that worry, that would cover 160 to 10 meters, you know, 100 kilowatts on each band. Maybe the Eastern Europeans would like that better, you know, so, but not gonna get into politics here. Anyway, that's all usually the talks I've given, big antennas, contest antennas, new things, uh, and I thought, this is innovation this year. That's the theme of, of the ham vision. And it would be good just to go over some subjects and a whole bunch of uh, sort of a potpourri of things here, of things that I've done over the years that are very simple, uh, some new ideas to look at and things like that. And so it's not gonna be gigantic antennas and, and, and K3LR designs that we, we've done at his station and things like that. It's gonna be a, more things that hopefully you can take away from this and, and apply it yourself. And there's some new ideas I thought about in here after looking some things over as well. So one of the questions, because I was one of the developers of the uh, numerical electromagnetic code at Livermore Lab, and, and of course there's all kind of codes out there. You can spend $100,000 on commercial codes how good are these modeling codes? Okay, that's a, that's a question. We should sort of see if we can analyze uh, that with, with a dipole antenna. How, how good do the codes really do? And then there's this magic frequency, or magic formula, 468 over frequency. How many people memorize that? Everybody in here should put up their hands, right? And uh, uh, it turns out Ward Silver, I don't know if he's in the audience. Uh, yeah, there he is. Um, I'm going to talk about something he came up with. He should have wrote a, a big article, but it was on eham.net, and I'm going to talk about it and, uh, and then go into some things that uh, he first uh, questioned this. Where did this, this formula come from? How good is it? We all memorized it and so forth. Uh, and uh, the, the, the other thing is we're going to find out that formula doesn't really work all the time. It, it has things that uh, if, if the diameter varies of the wire or the tubing, it's going to be off, okay? There's other things like height above ground and, and other stuff. So it turns out it really doesn't work, and we'll talk about that, unless there's a very specific cases that it, it works. And so how can we use something else to go out there instead of doing trial and error where you you trim a little off, go back and measure it, trim a little more, go back and measure it. How can we get it where we only have to do it twice, okay? Do two times measure something and use something called interpolation that we can then go and come up with the, the correct design. And then looking at how this formula works, I was looking at all the plots of, you're trying to get resonance, right? That's where the imaginary part of the impedance goes to zero. And I kept looking at where all these curves, and there's a magic point that they all go through. And I said, maybe we can use that. I'm going to talk about that, okay? And then the 43-foot vertical, is that really the best height? Well, we're going to talk about that. And then I've had an antenna up at my house uh, that is for 80 and 40. I just get on the same sort of frequency ranges every night to talk to my friends. 
and this thing's been up since about 1990s, and I thought maybe some people might be interested in it and might want to use it. And then way back before all this short receive antennas were, you know, talked about and sold and so forth, in my backyard, I got a, a six ham sticks for 40 meters, the mobile antennas. This is back in the 90s. And I put an array together, all passive, okay, with uh, combiners and, and phasing lines and so forth. And I'm going to show a little bit about that. And it was an amazing receive antenna. Uh, and I'll talk about that. And then if I have enough time, because Tim, I got what, two hours or? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Anyway, uh, if I have enough time, I'm going to talk about a project we've just been working on uh, that's to replace a great big HF array. So I will talk about something big uh, down in uh, Antarctica at the South Pole. But uh, to design this thing, I used some, uh, some new ideas in log periodics that we wrote a paper with some years ago. And I actually, with words that help back there, have rewritten that section on the log periodic antenna in the new AWRL antenna uh, book that's coming out. Or maybe it is out, I don't know. Okay, so the codes. Um, most of the codes that i am uh, been familiar with, they're, and probably most of the hams are familiar with, uh, they're based on either NEC or mini neck, okay? And uh, Tim probably remembers, I used to come in the 80s and I'd bring like all these CDs, or not CDs, like floppy disks, and they had the code on and, and uh, there'd be a mad rush up <laughs> at the Ed Tetafor because I was passing them out like, like free, you know, so. But anyway, uh, the mini neck and, and uh, some of these are free. You can get them just by downloading for NEC2 up on the right, that's free. That uses NEC2. Uh, MMANA, uh, that's uh, free. That's uh, using the mini NEC algorithm. And they, they've done a lot of great things on how to get the segments automatic in there. It gives really accurate results. Roy Llewellyn had uh, LNEC get started and an easy NEC. And then he has retired from that, and so you can go and get everything for free now from uh, 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 EasyNeck, and uh, that's pretty amazing. And then some of my students and us at Penn State, we came up with something called GNEC. It's not in existence anymore, but I still use it a lot. And then there's commercial packages, okay? These are, if you got big bucks, like the, the big contractors, uh, FICO over on the uh, top left, uh, CST Microwave, ANSYS, HFSS, and uh, Whipple D. These all use something similar to what's in NEC, and then they use other techniques as well for some of them. And uh, they usually uh, cost, though, about uh, fifty to $100,000, okay? And that's per year, you know, to... to to use these things. So uh, you got to really be into some big time contracting and so forth to have these. I do have access to FICO. And, and if you're at a university, a lot of the universities have all these codes for very low price because they want the students, these companies want the students to learn their codes. So when they go out and get a job, they say, we use this code back at the university. We should get it for the company. And so uh, any students at universities usually have access to these things. Okay, so how accurate are these codes on a, on a half-wave dipole? Well, we're gonna model a half-wave dipole a little bit differently than just the wires and segments that people that do modeling may be familiar with. We're gonna actually take the dipole, pick the half-wave, and then a radius, uh, the sort of standard radius that people test is 0.001 wavelengths. And we're going to divide it up into a whole bunch of little tiny triangles, as you can see there. And then we're going to feed it between those two cylinders. So they're actually metallic cylinders. And this will give a much more accurate result than the way the codes are normally done with, with wires and segments and so forth. So. Here's all the codes. You can see the key uh, at the bottom there. And uh, if you put it on a scale like this, this is for the real part of the impedance, looks like after about maybe, what, 30 segments, 
they're all on top of each other, okay? So it doesn't matter which technique you're using there, uh, they, they, they all agree pretty good. And there's neck four and neck two, okay? And then the imaginary, it's pretty good. It's, it's not quite as good, but uh, the, uh, the FICO cylinder is that, that sort of light blue. It's only one point at the end because there's no segments involved. It's just one value. And so you'd think that's the most accurate value. And it looks like uh, neck uh, four and neck two. And then if you use a lot of segments or the automatic segmentation in that MMANA, you get really good results, okay? And so those are pretty good. But then if you blow it up a little bit, you zoom in, uh, there you find, again, that light blue that's uh, there uh, above the 200 line. Uh, it's agreeing very, very good with neck two. Neck four is a little bit off when you get that many segments, but if you look back, we would never use that many, like anywhere from you know 30 to to uh, 100, you're getting pretty close. Okay, but then the, the, the MN, MMANA is a little bit off, okay? That's the real. But then the imaginary, you blow that up, it's even off a little bit more. But you got to look at the scale. That's still pretty good. It's, uh, I, I sort of like to look at these scales, and you see we're pretty accurate. But there may be some differences of little bits of frequency shift and stuff between these codes if you're doing a real narrow band Yagi or something like that. Oh, gee, Penn State always has to come into this talk, you know, so. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next subject. And uh, Tim, if I, don't, if I go too long, just stop me and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do these next, next year. <laughs> the rest of them, <laughs> I think I can cover it here. Okay, 468 over frequency. Uh, where does this come from? That's a question that Ward back there asked. And he wrote an article in EHAM in May of 2010. And this article is very extensive on EHAM. It should have been on QST or, or you know, one of the, the bigger uh, uh, magazines there. And th this was actually a quote from Ward. He said, uh, every ham is expected to memorize it, but it's rarely correct. And he was right, it is rarely correct, okay? He did a lot of research and he found some things that Clear back to the antenna book, 1939. It, <clears throat> it said uh, that it's really this this five percent reduction from the a, a, a wavelength, a half wavelength, I should say, in free space. Uh, the formula for that is 492 over frequency. Some of you probably remember that formula too. And to get 468, you got to take 0.95. That's five percent less. And so. Uh, it was said that uh, it's the insulators at the end of the, the dipoles. And that sort of concept is has carried through for a long time. Uh, and then in the uh, 29 handbook, he found a formula, but there was really nothing that said, where did it come from? Right, Ward? It just uh, didn't say. It, it was a number there, but there were some, some things about it, but it wasn't perfect. Yeah, Ward. Right. Thank you, Ward. Yeah. You should come up here and uh, join in, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, your conclusion was, you know, just what you said there. And, and trial and error, you know, with an antenna analyzer is probably the best way to do it. So uh, here's a plot of every gauge of, of wire and diameter from number 40 30, 20, 16, you see it there, all the way up to six inches diameter. And this is for a 40 meter, 7.15 megahertz. 
And the formula, if you look here, you see these plus, but you're looking, where is the imaginary part going through zero? And it's anywhere from 93% to 98% of the 492 over F, which means it's 458 to 484. It's not 468, okay, for every diameter. And this is in free space. So which one is closest? Well, it turns out there's the formula, 468 over that, and it's three inches. Three inches is, is where the 468 works, okay? So if you're building a three-inch diameter dipole, you're going to be right on, okay? <laughs> and that's, a, that's actually 0 0.0009 wavelengths, which is pretty close to that sort of standard we use for testing uh, half-wave dipoles, 0 0.001. Well, what about over ground? It's pretty much the same, okay? Over, over ground, the same stuff. There's all the plots. And I did it over average ground, a, a typical height that a ham puts up, 35 feet. And which one is closest? For the three inches again, okay? So, so if you want to never worry about it and you want the formula to work, just put three inch pipe up in your yard and you'll be fine at 35 feet, okay? <laughs> so what about the end insulators? Well, FICO and a lot of these modern codes, they not only can model the metal, they can model the dielectric material as well. So what I did, I said, let's put some big insulators in there, like two inches in diameter and six inches long. That If there's gonna be an effect, you would think that kind of insulator at the end would work. And I embedded it uh, uh, about a, an inch or so in, inside there. You can see I, I made it transparent so you could see through uh, on that bottom right. And uh, those are the insulators, okay, at the end and see what happens. Well, turns out it's only a very small shortening effect. Uh, with no insulator, and this is number 14 wire, okay, uh, the resonance occurred with the formula 478 over F, and with the insulator, it was 476, almost no difference, okay? So that, that statement from way back that it was the insulators causing the 5% the reduction, that doesn't seem to be correct, okay? It's the inherent properties of the antennas themselves and the diameters of the antennas that's causing the effect. Okay, so how, would, how can we really know that we, we can get there without doing trial and error? Is there another way of doing it? And we're going to do something called the magic of interpolation. And so you might as well use that formula because everybody remembers it from taking the test, right? So do that first, 468 over the frequency. If you use 7.15, uh, you get 65.454 feet and call that length one, okay, in this, in this procedure. And then you measure the frequency where the SWR is lowest, call that F1, and if you did that, you'd find out that it's not at 7.15, it's up at 7255, okay, and call that F1. And then just add some arbitrary number, like two feet's good for 40 meters, just add two feet uh, to what you had in the uh, first one. So 65, you're going to add 2, you're going to have 67. Call that L2. And then find out where that resonates. And if you do that, you'll find out that's going to resonate down at 7035. If you measure it with your analyzer, call that F2. Now you got all the information to give you the correct length to get it where you want. And you use that magic formula there in red, plug in the numbers, and you get 66.4 feet. That should be the correct length to use. Uh, so remember the first length was with the formula, that was 72.55, there's the, the chart. The next one you added two feet, 7.035, and there's the correct length, 66.4. And if you could read those small numbers, it's right at 7.15. So you only need to do two things and you got it, no matter where you want it, use an interpolation because everything are straight lines through this narrow frequency range of 40 meters or any of the bands that, for that matter. Now you look some more and you notice, look at that circled region. All the curves are going through the same point, okay? 
All those diameters from number 40 wire, that's thinner than my hair, I still have some, and up to six inches, okay? And they all go through that same point. It's at 7.55 megahertz. And the uh, reactants is not zero, but it's 50 at all those diameters. And the formula for that frequency is 494 divided by F. That's very close to the, the actual half-wave formula, which is 492. But 494, that would be a good formula to remember for this procedure. And so uh, here's what you need to do. Uh, suppose we want the resonance back at 7.15. Uh, the reactance was J50, okay, uh, inductive. We need to put a series capacitor in series with the fee point of minus 50. So we need a capacitor, and you go through the formula, it comes out close to 500 picofarads, 445. And so you would uh, calculate the length, okay, uh, 494 divided by what frequency you want, that's 69 feet. Seems a little long, right? But remember, it, that's, that's what it is. And then you put the, uh, the capacitor in series, and you'll, you'll get it the, the uh, uh, this is with, without the capacitor. You can see it at uh, 7.15, it's at 50. And then you put it with the capacitor, and it, it resonates right at 7.15. And look at this. The, the red is for number 14 wire, blue's number 10, that's what most people use, and the violet is one inch. And you could put it any diameter, and it, they're all gonna resonate very close to 7.15 just by adding that capacitor. So if you have a ballon, you could put that capacitor in series with the, the lead, uh, and, and that would be it. You, you'd use this procedure. You'd never have to worry about diameter again, okay? Oh, gee, Penn State again. <laughs> okay. Now, it may not work perfect for all heights. I didn't really explore the heights. I've never built, built it yet to test it. But innovation, we need people here to try it and see if it works. It, it may be something new to weigh the, to put up dipoles, okay, where you just don't even worry anymore about the diameter of the dipole. But you do have to have a capacitor. Remember, I did show doorknobs. Doorknobs would be good because they can handle a lot of power. If you don't have a lot of power, you could probably use something else. How am I doing on time, Tim? Okay, good. <laughs> You'll tell me when I'm getting close, I know. Uh, 43, 43 foot uh, vertical. I think you guys sell that, don't you? And a lot of people have, have sold these. And they're good. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is not going to be a big complaint, but it doesn't work good. It works good on most all the frequencies. Uh, and my analysis here is assuming that you have many, many radials, okay? It's, it's sort of like the perfect ground system. Uh, but this 43 thread vertical, the reason it works good is you have a tuner at the feed point right at the feed point, okay? Because you don't want high SWR on the coax, that increases the loss. So if you're, now tuners, depending on the impedance and where they can match on the Smith chart, they can have some loss too, but if it's a good tuner, it probably can match just about anything uh, without too much loss. Well, these are the, the patterns there. It's, it's uh, uh, let's see. Uh, shown at the top uh, left is 3 megahertz, then 5 megahertz in the middle, top, 10, and then uh, 15, and then 20. Look what happens. The lobes are starting to lift, okay, at 20 megahertz. And then at 25, they're definitely lifting there. And look at, look at 30 megahertz. They're going like this, okay. And so I thought, that's maybe not what we want, okay. We like those top plots those ones near the, the, the top of the band, those maybe don't look so good. Here's the SWR. If you do a one-to-one -one ballon into those uh, before the tuner, you know, you might want to put a, a, a transformer in there first. It could even be an un, -un and then put your tuner. The tuner might be easier to work with on the regions of the Smith chart. The one-to-one's pretty bad. That's a one-to-20 VSWR range, but a one-to-four 
seems to be pretty good. And that's in the literature. You can read one to four people use, and then they put their tuner on that. And a one to six, the violet isn't too bad either, okay? So that might be something you want to do. But I think a better choice would be 20.5 feet for the vertical, okay? Now, this maybe isn't going to work real good on 160, okay? The 43, you need as much height as you can get. But uh, uh, from 80 meters up, 20.5 looks pretty good as long as your tuner can tune it, the, the impedance. And I think the tuners probably could. And now look what happens. Uh, the second row there, that's 15 on the left, 20 in the middle, 25 on the right, and 30 megahertz at the bottom, all very low angle, nothing shooting up in the air. So maybe a 20 and a half foot vertical might be better than a 43 foot vertical. But anyway, it's just some thinking about it. Haven't built it and tested it. Then I thought maybe another approach would be put a dipole that's sort of about the same height as, as what the vertical at 40 feet and uh, run a coapse, uh, coax up through the, the tubing. And then uh, it turns out, if you look at the impedance, the green here is a, a 1 to 12 type uh, ballon or 12 to 1 ballon. That seems to be about the best. And uh, put that in the middle and, and feed the top and the bottom as a dipole. But then you have to somehow isolate that coax at the bottom because currents are going to flow down there. So, so I think a, a, a bunch of hunks of ferrite there might, might do the trick, okay? And I think there have been some designs like this, like isolator things. But look at these patterns. They look really good, really low angle, okay? So that might be another antenna that you could start selling. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's that subject. Okay, let's move on to another one. This is that antenna I've, I've had. It's nothing fancy. It's just something I came up with a long time ago. And I mean, you could probably find stuff similar in, in the antenna books and, and so forth. But this thing has worked all these years, okay? So in the 1990s, it's just a, an inverted V fan and uh, fed from the same feed point. And so the 80 meter is in a straight line and then uh, I tilt the 40 meter 15 uh, degrees, okay? It's tilted 15 degrees away. That seems to be enough that you don't get a lot of interaction. If you try to line them up in parallel, get a lot of interaction and the, the bandwidth gets real narrow and so forth. And, uh, and then just slope this down about 30 degrees from the horizontal. The only disadvantage is you need, you need four anchor points on the ground. Okay, but I, I cut the grass all the time and just cuts right around them. So it's, and they've been up for, for a long time. Uh, I use this number 12 uh, a Luma Weld. We, uh, we use that exclusively at all my contest stations. I love that stuff. Number 10, uh, I've got miles of the stuff. And I like it better than Copper Weld because even though there's probably no difference, the Copper Weld gets sort of oxidized after a while and gets sort of a, a layer on it and gets sort of blackish or whatever. Luma well just gets this very thin white powder and it, it never, it always looks glistening in the sun. I always thought that seems like that's better, but that's just psychologically, you know. But uh, it's real stiff though to work with, but it, it is good stuff. Anyway, the 40 meter leg is about a foot longer on each side than what you would get if, if the 80 meter wasn't there. To make this work right, you have to tune the lowest frequency first. So 80 meters you'd tune first with that interpolation procedure. And then you work your way up to 40 because 80 affects 40, but 40 doesn't affect 80 because it's shorter. And then at Angel's house, we even did a, a 80, 40, 20, and I think you used that for years. And it worked. We, we worked Indonesia and all kind of stuff on that thing, up about, what, 25 feet or something at your one house there. So the fan antenna is a pretty good antenna. There's sort of what the SWR. It's not great patterns, but it's good enough to, you know, talk to friends uh, every night like I do and things like that. Okay. Another uh, topic, still got time, right? <laughs> Another topic, 
back in the 1990s, before there was much even talked about with short vertical receiver rays and you know high impedance amplifiers and all that kind of stuff, I I uh, was at the Ham Fest. And I think the company was Transcell. I don't know if they're still in existence. I bought a whole bunch of, of these hamstick antenna, mobile antennas, six of them. I think I bought some more because I was big in mobile back then too for every band. But I bought six for 40. And I said, let me just mount those on the ground and see if I can build an array and then uh, run phasing lines and go into a passive uh, combiner from mini circuits, okay? And everything I got was from mini circuits, I remember back in those days, everything passive. And uh, I, I remember tuning the antenna. I had to add some radials. You'd, I wanted the antenna to be 50 ohms uh, for each antenna. And I used the noise bridge in those days, and that was before the days of analyzers, like we have Rig Expert and MFJ. And, uh, and I built this thing, and so, uh, we, we uh, had 17 foot spacing between the verticals, so it's not a real, you know, big long line. And, uh, and it needed phasing of 150 degrees and 300 degrees, okay? And you can see there's all the formulas and everything for 7.2 megahertz. And you need a phase inverter in the center, which was just a transformer. Well, here's some of the parts. Uh, uh, you can still buy uh, the, uh, the whips there uh, from DX Engineering. MFJ has these ham sticks. You can buy a mount that it, it's, it's made to sort of mount on a mirror or a pipe. And so I had a ground stake in the ground and, and mounted the six uh, ham sticks. There's a combiner there, a three to one combiner for mini circuits with quite a bit of isolation between the ports. That's important. Uh, attenuators, everything was BNC, okay, so BNC cables, RG58 or RG8X or something. So there's six dB attenuators, you need those on the two outer, that gives a, what's called a binomial current distribution, one, two, one, and that's a, that's a good uh, thing to have for getting the side lobes down. And uh, there's a transformer, you could get in and make it a phase inverter, and then if you don't have enough signal, which I did have enough, you, you could put an amplifier in there too for mini circuits, a gain block and run DC to that and so forth. So uh, this is actually a, a, a GNEC model. Uh, you can make a sort of look realistic in GNEC. And so there will be three verticals right there. Again, 17 foot spacing between them. They're just ham sticks, okay? No, no extra stuff. There's the pattern that you get from three inline ham sticks, which is pretty pretty good pattern. I mean, we're down 30 dB in elevation and good 30 uh, dB off the back of this thing in asthma. So that's just one single three, three element inline, all passive, okay, with mini circuits type stuff and ham sticks. And then uh, what I did was I spaced two of these 80 foot apart which is about the right spacing uh, to get the side lobes way down. And, uh, and there were six, uh, six element arrays, two inline columns. And there's a pattern you get on that. So now the pattern's really good in the azimuth as well. And so that's very, very close, maybe even better in some respects than, than what a beverage would be, okay? Uh, I remember having this thing on and I put it on like a sh when shortwave broadcasting was on back then, put it on some station out of Spain or something, and it was Voice of America, and it was like, you know, 40 over 9, and I could switch the, the phasing so I could get the direction switch, switched uh, to the back, and the thing went into like an echo chamber. It, it just sounded like it was in a reverb chamber, the, the modulation, and it, it dropped like, like 40 dB or something, okay? It was, it was really impressive that I could give you that effect. I wish I would have made some recordings. I never thought to make recordings back then, so I, I can't play that to you. Oh, gee, there's Penn State again. <laughs> okay, I'd like to just end with something if I still got time, Tim. 
Uh, this is a project we got at Penn State recently. I'm not going to go into all the detail about it, but there is something important here uh, that happened with this that just sort of things worked out that I, I got this design method uh, talking with Ward and wrote it up for the, the new uh, uh, AWRL antenna book, a, a new way to design log periodics. So super darn, uh, uh, probably Nathaniel would be better to come up here, but anyway, super, <laughs> super darn is a, a great big uh, radar network called the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network. Mainly it's in the uh, auroral region, or at least that's where it's looking to, is in the auroral region. And uh, these are Doppler radars. There's 35 of them around the world, okay? And they get backscatter, sort of like we get backscatter on 20 meters and stuff. They get backscatter from the irregularities, and they can look at physics uh, uh, going on, high latitude fields and global structures of, of, of dynamics of the uh, earth space environment, things like that. So, and there's a few pictures of some of the, some of the systems there. There's one in uh, Saskatoon. Now, these systems are not all the same, but they're pretty close. There's 40, I'm sorry, there's 20 uh, log periodics, HF, they cover eight to 20 megahertz, and they're usually up about 50 feet. They're about 40 foot booms. And, and then there's four in the back. The, the 20 in the front gives you azimuth steerability, okay, when you phase them. And they, they hook up 600 uh, watt uh, uh, a pulse transmitters to each one, okay? And so there's 20 times 612 kilowatts. The ones in the back are for detecting elevation angle for the uh, scatter that comes back from the ionosphere. And so there's a whole bunch of these things all over. That's in Canada. The ones that uh, NSF came to us at Penn State to rebuild the whole system uh, is in the South Pole in Antarctica. And I know you're asking, is he going to go to Antarctica at that age? And no, no, I probably won't. My younger days, I would have. We'll send uh, Nathaniel down there. He'll, he'll volunteer for it. But anyway, what happens in Antarctica is the snow keeps, keeps coming, it never melts, right? It never has gotten above 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the highest temperature ever at the South Pole. So the antenna was originally at 20 feet, and that was even too low. The scientists thought the snow is like air, and it's like operating in free space. And so one of the things I did was show them, no, there's, there's a layer of dielectric, and you get patterns and things off of that. We should be up at 50 or 60 feet, okay? And, but now the antenna is only 10 feet. In 10 years, the snow is built up, and it went from 20 feet to 10 feet, okay? And so the whole thing has to be replaced. And so uh, we said, we're going to come up with a log periodic design, but instead of making it out of tubing, and only a few elements, we're gonna make it out of wires, okay? And we're gonna use many wires, because this paper that I, I had some years ago was how to design high front-to-back log periodics. And they won high front-to-back, because the systems they have now only have 10 to 15 dB front-to-back, so they don't get all the scattering from where they think they're getting it for the scientific purposes. So we're gonna design it. But then, this is the old method. This is the method that's in the current AWRL uh, antenna books. And what happens is you, you look up on all these charts and everything, but the boom length comes out at the end. And so you might design something you think is going to be really good, and the boom's going to be 200 feet long, okay? It's just not going to work good. So we wrote this paper some years ago, 96, with a, my, one of my PhD students, and uh, it, it got published in the journal. And this is where you pick the boom up front, okay? You pick the boom up front, and then you can pick the number of elements. And there's a program, LPCAD, that uh, Roger Cox did that, that used a lot of this information. And so here's some formulas. This is all going to be in the new uh, antenna uh, book. And you can design things and, and iterate and get really high front to backs, okay? The other thing that scientists wanted, they only use horizontal polarization. If they could use diagonal polarization, they could get polarization effects from the scattering. 
And so uh, this would be the first site that would have that uh, capability, and then maybe all the other sites would, would do this as well. So in the lower left there, you can see, sort of barely, I guess, you can see the, the log periodic. It's a diagonal. It's going to be made out of wires. And there's the SWR at the top. But if you look, that's a 40 dB range on those plots. A lot of the side lobes are down 35 dB in the back, OK? So it has an extremely high front to back. But it has 33 wires, uh, 33 elements on each polarization uh, to get this kind of front to back. And remember, it's only going from 8 to 20 megahertz. You need that many wires. Anyway, this is just sort of some artistic concepts that we have for it. It's put it up with towers and Philly strand and, and wires. And there's a top view of what it would sort of look like. And uh, that's a project that, you know, uh, I'm still being associated with, OK, at Penn State. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to, to build this, uh, get it going in a couple years here. OK, there's uh, Penn State. And just real quick, I, I'm not going to talk any long about this, but some of you know that I've been working with some other fellas. Mark here is in the audience, K0LO, and Carl's uh, K, uh, K3ARL. The main person was N3EB, Eric, but unfortunately he passed away from uh, COVID. And so we're still continuing this station. Uh, we call it Camp Kilowatt, or Camp K for short. And we say it's on the magic mountain because just with a dipole up there, inverted V at 100 feet on 40 and up at 200 feet on 80, this thing is unbelievable with the diffraction that you get from the terrain effects. And it's, it many times can beat people that are running Yaggies and things like that. And we also built a, a 20 meter uh, six element and I, I, I pushed the computer to its limit, okay? <laughs> to get the most bandwidth we could above the band, and I call it the ice model because we get ice like that. And even when the ice gets on the antenna, it shifts down, but this uh, 20 meter Yagi, the, this OWA ice model, is starting like below the band, below 14 megahertz, and it has great SWR all the way to uh, close to 15 megahertz, okay? And the pattern is all the way up there. The computer just pushed and pushed, and it came out, okay? These are just some pictures. I won't go into this. And, of course, I have to give credit uh, to people that have inspired me. This is innovation theme this year. Uh, Maxwell is, he's the guy, okay, that came up with everything of equations to describe antennas and electromagnetics. And, and John Krause, WHJK, how many people have heard that call? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, he was a real inspiration. I, I wore out his book, okay, in college. I, that, I had to get another copy. And I did get a, a second edition I reviewed, and he sent me a great note there, got the note, John. And then this guy here, this guy spent his whole life on dipole antennas and monopoles, RWP King. And he did measurements way back that were so good at the time that they're still used today to, to check if, if your analysis is correct. And he lived to 101, and he was still writing papers and books at age 100, okay? And these are two of the books. This uh, theory of linear antennas is about that thick. It's mainly on dipoles, okay, and monopoles. And then the rays of cylindrical monopole or the cylindrical dipoles is a rays of things that he did, and it it it's amazing. I learned a lot from uh, this guy as well. So we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'll be around like uh, Frank at the Hope, and also uh, answer any questions after. Thank you so much, and thanks to Tim for putting on this great uh, forum.